Hey, back again here to finish up the chapter three lecture notes about the Beatles. We left off with Ringo Starr leaving Rory Storm and the Hurricanes and formally joining the Beatles. So now we will get started talking about the Beatles and their rise to being the biggest band in history. Uh, I refer to the next couple of years as the pop years because, again, they were, for lack of a better term, they were a boy band here at the very beginning. Uh, they were given a gimmick, they were given a style, and they played a certain type of music. It was meant to appeal to maybe younger fans. Uh, it was meant to appeal to uh, teenage girls as opposed to, uh, you know, all teenagers uh, or appeal to girls more so than guys. It doesn't mean that the Beatles didn't have male fans, but again, they had a gimmick. Um, the first album that the Beatles release is Please Please Me came out in March of 1963. It was certified platinum. Uh, the entire album, of course, this is when they are first getting started recording for EMI. Uh, other than having a, a big reputation in the bars and clubs, you know, they weren't a known entity on the radio. So George Martin had to squeeze them in where he could. They recorded the entire album in a single day. Uh, they, they had three top three songs, uh, even though it didn't chart. I don't know if it was released as a single or even a B-side, but you know, I saw her standing there as one of the uh, better known Beatles songs that's on this album, even though it, it didn't become a hit single. Love Me Do goes to number one. It was actually released as a single to build up hype for the album. You know, As soon as they had it recorded, they went ahead and released it as a single so it could be played on the radio, build up hype. So when the al full album's released in March of 1963, you know, People know who the Beatles are, and they go out and they buy the album. But Love Me Do goes to number one in uh, 1962, late 1962. She Loves You ends up becoming a number one single when it's released in 1963. And just to show the legs that this album had, and really any Beatles albums have, uh, it, it Twist and Shout, which was... Uh, it was a cover of an American song. It makes it to number two in 1964. Now, the next album that they release again with EMI, and one of the things that you're going to see, uh, you notice uh, here on this uh, label where my cursor's at, uh, Parlophone was the label under EMI that they recorded with. Uh, it would be released in England in November of 1963 as with the Beatles in the United States, they had to cut a distribution deal with American record labels to release the album in January of 1964 before they start their uh, America, first American tour. It's released in the U S as meet the Beatles in January of 64. So, you know, two months, two and a half months after it came out in England. Uh, you didn't have a huge, because I mean, this was their second, uh, think about your favorite singer, your favorite band, and how much time there is in between, uh, re you know, album releases, uh, you know, especially as a band gets older, as a band gets more and more famous they might not release an album you know every two years every three years or sometimes you might even go longer than that uh you know a band like the rolling stones which they've been around for decades they might go seven eight twelve years in between releasing albums uh metallica might go seven or eight years between releasing new albums 
but at this point in time, since the Beatles are young, since they're new, they're still trying to get their name out there. They're in the studio whenever they can get them in the studio. They record songs so they can get them out on the radio and uh, get them out on the radio and get their name out there. So Please Please Me comes out in March of 1963 with the Beatles comes out just a handful of months later, eight months later, they release another LP. So it didn't sell as well in England. Uh, Rollover Beethoven was a another cover song of American rock. It was a Chuck Berry song. It made it to number 68 on the charts, but this album really, honestly, I think the reason that they released with the Beatles, because it wasn't as strong of a, LP as Please Please Me was just so they had something new to release whenever they end up starting their American tour in 1964, as opposed to bringing a year old album with them when they come to the United States. Now, when the Beatles end up coming to the U.S. in early 1964, uh, before they played a concert, they had two appearances on the Ed Sullivan show. Uh, the Ed Sullivan show, you know, I've already talked about Ed Sullivan a little bit when we were in chapter two talking about uh, the different uh, variety shows that, you know, people like Elvis, Jerry Lee Lewis, performers like that would uh, end up popping up on to get their name out there. Well, they did the same thing with the Beatles. They know this is going to be a big band. So what they end up doing is they arrange, you know, Ed Sullivan knows that this is going to be a big hit for him. People are going to be tuning in. So to stretch that out and get viewers, you know, big viewers multiple uh, weeks in a row, he signs the Beatles up for two, you know, a, a show two weeks in a row. I don't know that Ed Sullivan ever did that again. But again, they also had to play around the fact that the Beatles are only going to be in town for a certain length of time. So, they stick around for a week. They play February 9th, 1964. They play again a week later on February 16th. And in two appearances on the Ed Sullivan show, they estimate that 70 million people tuned into the Ed Sullivan show. And most of those tune-ins were new viewers just to see the Beatles. Uh, their next album, again, the, the Beatles are cranking songs out. If they weren't on tour, they were in the studio. If they came home for three weeks, EMI had them in the studio recording because everything they were touching turned to gold. Uh, a Hard Day's Night ends up coming out in July of 1964. It was a soundtrack for the first movie that they did, also called A Hard Day's Night. Uh, the Beatles, this was their first album because they had become a phenomenon. The big thing here is they are starting to make some real money. So the record label is willing to invest more in them. And as musicians, they weren't just about making the music, writing the songs, you know, at least two, three of them they were really into the technology behind recording and producing the music as well. So starting with A Hard Day's Night in the summer of 1964, this was the Beatles' first album that they recorded using four tape tracks. You know, the progress at this point had been mono, which is where you had one tape recording the entire band, the instruments, the vocals, everything. And, you know, mono was the way that music was recorded everywhere at least up until I don't know at least 56 57 then you start to see stereo which is two tracks recording at the same time so they might do an instrumental playthrough of whatever song they were recording and then do a vocal track where they're listening to the music in headphones. You know, if you watch any new movie or any documentary about musicians when they're, they're in the recording studio and they go into a soundproof booth, they put the headphones on and they're just singing into the mic. Well, the music's being pumped into the headphones and they're singing along to the music, but the vocals are going to be recorded on a separate track. 
So that way you don't have to get the music perfect and the vocals perfect all at the same time. When you were just doing one recording, everything had to be played just right or you had to do another take. So with stereo, you can put the vocals on one track, you can put the instruments on another track, mix them together, and you know it, it, it sped up the production process. So if you play the music perfectly, but you still need to work on the vocals, that's all you have to do. The musicians don't have to keep playing while the vocalist is fine-tuning the performance. With four-track recording, now what they could do is they could do the vocal they could do the lead vocals on one track they could do the backup vocals on a separate track they could do the lead and rhythm guitar on the third track they could do the bass and the drums on the fourth track and then mix them all together so again it, it makes it easier when everybody isn't singing and playing especially in this group where if you're not singing lead, you're singing backup. Harmony was a big thing with the Beatles. And all four of them play an instrument. So this way, on they could do vocal tracks where they focused on their singing. They could do music tracks where they focused on their instrument work. And then you have the guitars playing together. And then you have you know, what forms the foundation of the rhythm, the bass and the drums, on another track. And again, if the bass and the drums, if they've got that down good, then they still need to work some things out with the vocal track or they need to work some things out with the guitars. They can do that. And it doesn't cause everybody to have to keep doing their parts over and over. Um, also, what you're going to see the Beatles do as time goes on and as technology moves forward, they start getting a little more experimental. And because you have musicians that can play multiple different instruments uh you might have things where they're playing their regular albums as they start to add a you know six tracks as they start to add eight tracks of recording then they can do the vocals they could do backup vocals and then they have six other uh recording tracks that they could do different instrumentation on they could do their regular instruments guitars bass you know drums but then George Harrison might decide to add in a sitar track. You know, Paul McCartney or John Lennon might sit down and record a piano track for it. Uh, so as more taping tracks are added to their recording process, you start to see their music become more and more elaborate. But it all starts here with Hard Day's Night, where they move from stereo to tape track recording to a Hard Day's Night, where they switch to four tape tracks. Again, not the only songs on this album by far. Uh, this was an LP, but Can't Buy Me Love and A Hard Day's Night both become gold singles, and they end up going to number one on the sales, or on the pop charts. The next album, and, and what I'll do is when I talk about an album, I'll have the cover over here to the right. This is Beatles for Sale, and this was more a look at what EMI was doing to them. You look at the picture here and you know Ringo might just kind of look lost, but my opinion, you know, you look at Paul, you look at John, you look at George, they look tired. They they look worn out. And by December of 64, you know, they've been recording They've been together as a band for two years now. They've been recording pretty much for 63 and 64. And like I said, from the time they took off, it has been being on tour. And now that you know they've gone worldwide, uh, it's being on tour for the short periods of time that they're home and they don't have gigs lined up. They have to get into the recording studio. Uh, Beatles for Sale, the recording session for this album started six days after the last session for recording A Hard Day's Night. So they record an album. They release it in July of 64 to go along with the movie. They started their next album, which comes out five months later. They started recording that album six days after they finished their previous album. They were being worked to death. Uh, in those six days, 
you know, the reason that they didn't start or the reason that the production crew didn't start them right after they finished a hard day's night is in those six days between a hard day's night and starting Beatles for sale, they had to play five, uh, they had to play five concerts or play multiple concerts in five different countries. In some cases, you know, of course, Europe countries are a lot smaller than the United States is. So this would be like a band here in the United States. You know, they played concerts in five different countries in six days. It's like traveling, a band traveling from state to state, playing a concert every night. Except here, they had five shows in six nights, but they were going, through, they were having to go through customs. They were having to travel to different countries and play in front of, you know, crowds that spoke different languages. Now, if a band goes on a world tour or a European tour, yeah, they might be playing in, you know, a lot of times they might just play one show in one country, but they might give themselves two days or three days to travel and then play two, you know, play two shows in France and give them a, give themselves a day of travel, then play two shows in Germany, give themselves another day of travel, play one show in Italy and give themselves a day to travel. And then they play a show in, you know, Prague or something like that. But, you know, this, these guys were working really hard. They played, they recorded an album they played five concerts in six days in foreign countries, come back to England, and they immediately start working on their next album. Uh, again, Hard Day's Night was the focus. You know, Beatles for Sale, it didn't do as well, but a lot of that could just be that, you know, there were already Beatles songs out there being played on the radio, especially when you think about how, you know, performers might only release one album a year or a, an album every two years or something like that. Uh, at this point, you've got bands that are releasing albums, you know, six months at a time. And, you know, it, it, it kind of makes it hard to get all of your music out there and get all of your stuff on the radio eight days a week, which again was another, uh, another thing when they wrote that song, they said that the whole message behind eight days a week is that's how they felt like they were working. Well, there's only seven days in the week. They felt, you know, that they were getting, you know, the work never stopped. The touring never stopped. You know, they loved it, but, you know, it's, it's still work. Uh, it does. It also goes to number one as a single. This time they had eight months in between releases. Help ends up coming out in August of 1965. But again, you know, they put time into it and, uh, you know, this is when the band, again, it's another soundtrack. So, yeah, they took, they had eight months between Beatles for Sale and Help, but they recorded another movie. They had to write and record another soundtrack. The, the band, their sound starts to change here in 1965. Uh, they're slowly starting to move beyond that boy band pop sound. Uh, again, Help is one of their most famous albums they ever made, although the biggest albums are yet to come. But Help, Ticket to Ride, Yesterday, all number one singles off of the same album. Uh, Ticket to Ride was actually the B-side of the Help single. You know, Help, the A-side, that was supposed to be the big single. Ticket to Ride was just what they felt was a weaker song or not as strong as help that since it got released on the single as the B side, it could also be played on the radio. It goes to number one, just like help did. Uh, help was also, uh, you know, another Beatles movie where the movie wasn't all that great, but again, you know, it made, it made lots of money just because, Beatlemania was going on and Beatles fans were going to end up going to see this movie. Again, the the crazy work schedule kicking in, they were still going to be touring. You know, when they weren't touring, they were in the recording studio. December of 1965, they released another album, Rubber Soul. 
this is the first album that they had with set recording dates where everything up to this point has been, okay, we've got a little time here. We'll get you in the studio when you're not touring. We'll get you in the studio when you're not, you know, if you all have to go film some scenes for the movie and then the production crew has got to change locations, you'll have two days then we'll get you in the studio in those two days. Oh, you've got these three shows over the course of four days. Well, uh, you've got two days off before you have to go back to filming. After that, we'll get you in the studio for a little while during those two days off. Rubber Soul, December of 65. The band got together in 1962. December of 1965 was the first time that they recorded with set recording dates. We are not going to do anything else. We're going to record this. We're going to record. We've been writing songs in our spare time, but we're going to start recording on December, uh, you know, on not December of 65, but we're going to start recording on this date. We're not doing anything else until we finish recording on this date. And that will give us a certain amount of time for post-production to get the album ready to get out to stores. This was the first album with set recording dates. The, the title, Rubber Soul, was an inside joke with the guys in Rolling Stone because uh, critics of the Rolling Stones had referred to Mick Jagger's soul uh, singing or blues sound as plastic soul. And the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, even though they were rivals you know in terms of popularity you know the way people looked at it you were a Beatles person or you were a Stones person and uh, if you turned out to be the type of person that you know where the Beatles were a boy band they were the good guys the type of guy that you know parents wouldn't mind their daughter bringing home uh, you know for a family holiday or something like that the Rolling Stones were supposed to be the, the first real bad boys of rock and roll. So the media set them up to be opposites. You had the Beatles that were the good guys. You had the Rolling Stones who were the bad boys. And that was all marketing. The Rolling Stones, that's what was supposed to, they portrayed themselves in a way that that's what would attract fans, is they were the opposite of the Beatles. In reality, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, they hung out together. You know, they they helped each other musically. Uh, the first hit that the Rolling Stones had was actually written by John Lennon and Paul McCartney, you know, just to kind of help them out. You know, there's a song that we had, you know, there wasn't room to put it on the last album we recorded here. We'll make a few changes. You, know, you all can record it. And it ended up uh, being a charting song for the Rolling Stones. But so this was an inside joke uh, because people had criticized Mick Jagger's singing style. Uh, they called their album Rubber Soul. Uh, the Rolling Stones did the same thing uh, where when we get to Sgt. Pepper, you'll see it's a really crazy album cover. Well, the Rolling Stones release their own crazy album cover for one of their uh, LPs that's kind of poking fun at the Beatles and Sgt. Pepper. But again, you know, it was all in fun because the two groups were friends with each other. Folk rock at this point was starting to become big. We'll talk about folk rock uh, in chapter four after we come back from Christmas break, uh, 1964, 1965. By this point, I think they had met Bob Dylan in person and you know, Bob Dylan said, he goes, you know, I really like the music that you all are making, but you know, it feels kind of artificial. It doesn't feel like there's any real message behind your songs. And John Lennon and Paul McCartney take that to heart. And you, you're going to start to see the the sound of the Beatles change here in their next few albums. Uh, but the music here is a departure from the poppy kind of songs that they had been releasing on their previous uh, five albums. Uh, this one is more of a folk rock feel even though they didn't chart as well, Nowhere Man still made it to number three on the pop charts. It was another gold certified song. Uh, Drive My Car, Michelle. Uh, get radio play and you might still hear them like if you pick up a Beatles Greatest Hits album or something like that. But they didn't chart the same way that uh, some of their other, well, even Help a few months earlier had done. 
And like I said, uh, somebody like Bob Dylan, a, a singer songwriter that the band respected when he makes a comment and says, you know, your album or your songs, they're great. They're catchy. They're popular, but they don't really have a message. You start to see them take that to heart. And as their sound changes, there starts to be a lot more subtle imagery messaging uh, beneath the surface in a lot of their songs. Uh, this brings us into what I refer to as the psychedelic years because also the uh, this would be the time period where the Beatles start to experiment uh, with LSD. Uh, supposedly, I think it was George and Ringo uh, made a dentist appointment together and uh, it was when their uh, dentist supposedly dosed them with LSD. They're like, hey, that wasn't that bad. Now, that could have just been an excuse. That might have been, the, oh, we didn't know we were taking it uh, before they did. But as time goes on, the whole band starts experimenting with uh, recreational pharmacology. And it, it does affect the type of music that they're making. This is also the beginning of Revolver, which came out in August of 66. This is the beginning of what's referred to as the studio years, where it was released right before their last tour finished in 1966. None of the songs off of Revolver were played while they finished out that tour. And after that, they stopped doing live performances. Uh, they were just a studio band. You know, by that point, they had released six albums. They had toured all over the world, been on all types of different TV shows. Everybody knew who the Beatles were. If they could just stay in the studios, then they could do so much more, especially as they start to experiment with multi-track recordings. They're making songs that they couldn't play and have them sound the same way live. Um, <clears throat> now, it's considered revolver is considered one of the greatest technical achievements in rock and roll history, because again, this is when they start expanding into six tracks. And then later on down the road, they're going to expand into eight track recording. Uh, this is the album that yellow submarine, uh, double a side that, you know, they felt Eleanor Rigby and yellow submarine were both good songs. So it was a double a side single yellow submarine makes it to number two. That was one of Ringo's songs that he got to sing. Uh, again, it's more of a comical song, humorous song. Eleanor Rigby makes it to number 11. Uh, the single ends up going gold. Uh, even though it didn't make it to number one, Eleanor Rigby is still considered one of their most famous songs ever. And again, because they are creating these epic, you know, LP recordings, they're not cranking stuff out every five months now uh you see from revolver in august of 66 sergeant pepper's lonely heart club hearts club band doesn't come out until june of 1967 they spent 168 days recording sergeant pepper tweaking this tweaking that again expanding uh the boundaries of what people think you can do in a recording studio. Uh, it's ranked number one on Rolling Stone's 100 Greatest Albums of All Time. They won their first four Grammys uh, with the recording of Sgt. Pepper in 1968. To this day, if they do a re-release of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, people that already have two or three copies of it will probably still go out and buy another copy. Uh, they continue to expand on the experimentation and stuff that they started on revolver, uh, different instruments, uh, running, you know, <clears throat> running different amplifiers through other things just to create new sounds. Uh, it was one of the first concept albums, you know, they are this band Sergeant Pepper and the Lonely Hearts Club Band. And they're basically 
performing, they're acting like another group while they're recording this whole album. The album spent 15 weeks at number one. They did not release a single off of Sgt. Pepper because, and that's why none of these are number one songs, even though it's considered the number one song or number one album of all time by Rolling Stone. No singles were released because when they recorded it, they recorded it and blended the music like it was one continuous composition. And if you listen to Sgt. Pepper on vinyl as opposed to on a CD, one song flows right into the next. There's no break. There's no stoppage of music. Uh, you know, the fade in and fade outs blend them together. If you listen to it on a CD, if you start on track one and you go to track two or you go to track three, in most cases, you're still hearing the end of the previous song on what would be, you know, when you skip to track two, you're hearing track one finish out, you know, as track two begins. Uh, Sergeant Pepper has sold millions of copies. Uh, you know, this is, while they might have been re-released on other albums, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band was the title track, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, Getting Better. You know, again, the whole album is classic Beatles songs. Then, uh, while all the Beatles had... Uh, been experimenting with LSD and you know other recreational drugs for a year or so now. The weirdness really kicks off with the Magical Mystery Tour in November of '67. Uh, back up here. Well, for some reason, it's not backing up. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, sorry computer wasn't responding. Now, Magical Mystery Tour ends up being released in November of 67. Uh, while they were recording this album, their manager, Brian Epstein, ended up dying of a drug overdose in late August, uh, and they, they never hired a new manager. After that point, they were so big, they had been involved in the music industry for long enough, they just decided not to hire another manager they just manage themselves uh, they weren't touring anymore so it was basically them and their producer george martin in the studio uh magical mystery tour was a soundtrack to a tv movie that they did and it was released on the bbc uh it like i said it was super weird you see the uh suits they're dressed up in one guy's got uh I think Paul is wearing. I think Paul is wearing the uh, dog mask. George has a hippo mask on. Ringo, I think, had a bird face. John is dressed up like a walrus. This is the uh, album that "I Am the Walrus" came from. Uh, it only made it to number fifty-six on the pop charts, but it's considered, you know, an iconic Beatles song, even if it isn't their greatest work. Uh, they still had number ones on, you know, Penny Lane, Strawberry Fields Forever. Penny Lane made it to number one. Strawberry Fields made it to number eight. All You Need Is Love made it to number one. Hello, Goodbye, another number one single. So the album was great, extremely popular, but the TV movie itself, just because of the weirdness, uh, critics couldn't tell what was going on, and fans, you know, up until this is as bad as, earlier Beatles movies were, people still talked about, oh, oh, it's the Beatles. I love the Beatles. I love Ringo. I love Paul. But yeah, uh, Magical Mystery Tour, it was weird enough that people were like, that is, this is crazy. Now, this brings us into the last phase, the final years of the Beatles. Uh, the Beatles, or the White Album, as it's also known, was released in November of 68. This was their first release on their own Apple label, which, uh, by the way, their logo is a whole green apple. In the early 1980s, uh, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo ended up suing 
Apple computers because they were using the silhouette of an Apple. They, you know, it was copyright infringement. So that's why when, well, I have a case on mine, but you look on the back of your iPhone and it's the Apple with a bite out of it. That creates a different silhouette, a different symbol. So it's not copyright infringement, but that's the whole reason that Apple started using the Apple symbol with a bite taken out of the corner uh, is because the Beatles had sued them for copyright infringement for the use of the same logo. Now, uh, for the Beatles, this is the only double album of original material that was ever released. You might get a, a greatest hits album or something like that. That's two vinyl albums or three CDs, but the white album is the only double album of original material. They spent so much time in the studio that everybody, and that's another thing, you know, you're starting to get to the point the band is so big, everybody's egos, you know, George Harrison said there were too many egos in the band at that time. Everybody, you know, they're the Beatles, they're the biggest band in the world. Well, John Lennon's like, you know, I'm John Lennon in the Beatles. I'm Paul McCartney. I'm George Harrison. Even Ringo was like, oh, I'm Ringo. And they all had stuff that they wanted to do. You know, George Harrison was tired of just doing one or two songs on an album. He was writing his own music all the time. So he wanted to do more songs. George and Paul, or sorry, John and Paul are writing all the time. So they, neither one of them were content with just three or four songs on an album. So what you have is they're just like, screw it. We'll just record it. And you're starting, the egos are starting to clash. Uh, John looks at himself as the head of the band because he's the original member. You know, he's the one that started the quarrying. He's the one that brought Paul McCartney in. He's the one that gave the okay to bring George Harrison. But John was more of a free spirit. You know, after the death of Brian Epstein, Paul McCartney's the one that handled a lot of the business side of the music, you know, dealing with stuff for the band. So since he's the one that's kind of managing the day-to-day -day activities, he feels like, in addition to being a band member, in addition to being, you know, one of the major songwriters, he's also got a hand in the production. He's also got a hand in the business side of everything that the band's doing. He feels like he's the head of the band. Uh, George and Ringo don't feel like they're the head of the band, but they're starting to resent that they're treated like second level members of the band, whereas John and Paul are both talking like they're the leaders. Um, also, at this point, John Lennon has, uh, his relationship with Yoko Ono is starting to cause or add to the friction among the band members because they'll have band meetings. And even though John and Paul might talk like they're the band's leader. The band would always meet, and Ringo and George would also have input, even if you know, it might get disregarded. Well, as John and Yoko Ono, who was an artist, musician, exhibitionist, uh, as they start dating and it becomes more and more serious, she starts coming to their band meetings. She starts speaking up and giving her input at these meetings and it rubs the other three band members the wrong way because they're like, this is about the Beatles. You're not a Beatle. And at one point, you know, they say, you know, one of them, I can't remember which one of the guys it was goes to John and says, look, you know, she's not a member of the band. She doesn't need to be here. You know, this is, private this is a band matter she's not in the band she should be in the meeting and john basically told them look wherever i go she goes if she's not here i'm not here so he pretty much threatened to quit the band uh ringo did quit the band for a two-week period earlier in the year uh, as they were starting to put the album together and george had to go talk him into coming back 
this is the album where they switch to eight track recording and the songs become very elaborate. Uh, sometimes they have, again, like I say, you might have a vocal track, a background vocal track, then you have uh, a track for just the lead guitar, the rhythm guitar, the bass, the drums. That's only six tracks right there. Then you add in, you know, some other instrument like the piano then you still had another track that could be done for something else. Uh, I would have to go back and look it up. And I might've talked about this in class earlier, but there is a track on, or there's a song on this album where as one of the recording tracks out of the eight, eight, uh, one of the tracks was just, you know, the song ends and you've got dead air. There's silence. For a period of time and then on like the eighth recording track they added in a cricket chirping and while i was putting this chapter's notes together years ago uh i was listening to the music while i was typing up the notes and everything and i kept hearing this cricket chirp and because of the way that the song was produced and you know had a, i had a decent speaker system uh, there at my desk that I was listening on, with it being mixed in multi-track recording, well, it sounded like the cricket was chirping over here. And I'd get up and I'd go look, and it's just like if you've ever had a cricket driving you crazy, you hear it in one place, and as you walk and you get closer to it, it stops. And I'd go back and sit down. And then I'd hear it, and it sounded like it was coming behind, me, coming from behind me. So I'd get up and I'd look around. At one point, it had, it had sounded like it was coming from a corner of the room that I had a bookcase in, and it was driving me nuts. At this point, I took everything off of that bookcase. I drug the bookcase away from the wall. There was no freaking cricket. Finally, I gave up looking for it. I mean, it was driving me crazy. And as I started reading through the material that I was uh, pulling from to make these notes and stuff up, I get to it and it's like, you know, da 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 song. They even worked in a cricket chirping. And I had spent a half an hour tearing my room apart, trying to find this cricket that kept chirping. Even after it had stopped, I had to find this bug and get it out of the house. And it turns out that there was no cricket. It was just part of the recording of a specific song on the album. Uh, and I would never have known that if uh, I hadn't read it while I was preparing these notes. Uh, another interesting thing about this album on the song, While My Guitar Gently Weeps by George Harrison, he actually calls Eric Clapton in to play lead on this which even by this point, by 1968, Eric Clapton was already a legendary guitarist, you know, in terms of rock and roll and blues. Uh, and like I say up here, Harrison said there were too many egos in the band at this time by bringing Eric Clapton in, you know, well, for example, in a standard year where you all are in my classroom or in any classroom, you all have been sitting in class where Mr. Cox or, Bennett or Michael Fresh come in, you know, they come in, they sit down, watch what's going on in class, or maybe they get up and move around a little bit, ask you all some questions. But a lot of times the teacher acts differently, the students act differently because an outsider has come into the classroom. That's kind of what George Harrison was doing here when he invited Clapton in to play the guitar on this specific song. It had gotten to the point where the band was constantly fighting with one another. And he thought, okay, if I bring somebody else in who was a friend of everybody in the group, maybe a little too friendly because it turns out that uh, Eric Clapton ends up having an affair with George Harrison's wife. George Harrison and his wife end up getting a divorce and Clapton ends up having a relationship with uh, Harrison's ex-wife. Uh, so maybe they were a little too friendly, but what happens is he brings Eric Clapton in and because you have an outsider in, 
all the guys in the band that were squabbling and fighting all the time, their behavior changes. Again, you know, you don't see singles released on this. They're big enough that Beatles fans are going to go out and buy the albums. They don't have to get radio play. This is the point where the Beatles are so big, they are able to do whatever they want. And Beatles fans are going to buy it. Uh, some of the big songs off of this album, definitely not all of them. Back in the USSR, uh, Birthday, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, I've already mentioned, and Helter Skelter, which is supposed to be, uh, if you know anything about uh, Charles Manson and the Manson family uh, killings, uh, Helter Skelter is a song that when uh, Charles Manson listened to it, he proclaimed that Helter Skelter, you know, had like a secret message of a coming race war and, you know, was trying to prepare, you know, his followers for that. Uh, but if you, that weird story aside, if you listen to Helter Skelter, this is the first time where they really... You know, this is kind of precursor for what is to come in rock and roll. Like I said before, uh, George Harrison usually plays a really clean sound, but starting on several songs on this album, you start to hear him using more distortion, which again was already very popular in other types of rock music at this time. But, you know, Helter Skelter sounds completely different than anything else that the Beatles had done up to that point and very different from really anything else that was on radio at the time. Uh, you know, it, Helter Skelter is, you know, one of my, uh, I'd have to put it in, you know, the group of what I would consider my favorite Beatles songs, not because of the Charles Manson connection, but just because it's a different sound from a lot of what they usually do. Abbey Road. Now, Abbey Road was released in September of 1969. This is actually the last album the Beatles ever recorded together, but it's not the last album that the Beatles released. Let It Be, which I'll talk about after this one, since it was released the following year. Let It Be, they started working on Let It Be in the spring of 69, and because there was so much conflict between the band members, they just left the studio. They took two, three months off. They basically took the summer off away from each other, kind of let the tension die down. Then they came back in and they started over from scratch with a completely new album, even though they had a partially completed Let It Be sitting on the shelf. Uh, so Let It Be was recorded first, but they hadn't completed the production on it. When they came back together, uh, you know, July maybe of 69, they sat down and they recorded Abbey Road. The, the tension wasn't completely gone. Paul and John were in such great conflict with one another that they couldn't be in the same room, which is where multi-track recording really comes in handy, is because there were times they said that if Paul was in the studio John would call into the office first and he would find out if Paul was there. If Paul was already at Apple Studio, John wouldn't come in. Or he'd say, call me back when Paul leaves. And you know, it was a it was a huge accomplishment just to get all four band members into the same room, the same recording studio, because since they built their own studio, they had their own record label, they had it set up to where you might have a larger studio that the whole band could be in at one time. Uh, then they had smaller recording studios where you know Ringo could come in one room and he could record his drum track. George could come in three hours later and he could be working on the bass track for a couple of songs, or sorry, the lead guitar track for a couple of songs. Paul, while George is recording his music in one room, Paul might end up going into a, another room to record and he might be working on the bass tracks for complete or the piano tracks for completely different songs. And then what would happen is, is, you know, George Martin, the producer 
and the band members, they would come in independently and they would just work on stuff on their own and then it would get mixed together. And it turned out to be one of the biggest albums of all time. Uh, it sold 12 million plus copies. It's considered number 14 on Rolling Stone's 100 Greatest Albums of All Time. Uh, this album, going back to uh, an earlier, I want to say 1967, but it might have been one of the 68 albums, uh, a rumor got started by an American DJ that Paul McCartney had actually died and there was a huge scandal cover-up that they didn't tell their fans, you know, and this just explains why the Beatles quit playing uh, live shows, why they quit playing in public, is because something had happened to Paul, and that's why they're not releasing multiple albums a year. That you know, that's why we're going a year in between new Beatle, Beatles music coming out. Uh, that's why they don't play live anymore, and it was just a joke. But Beatles fans went nuts about this, and the conspiracy theories started spiraling from it. And, you know, supposedly he had died in a car crash. And, uh, you know, the, the thing was, is that sometimes, you know, the, the Beatles fans, because especially if, you know, they were the ones that would kind of buy into conspiracy theories to begin with, they're like, you know what? That makes sense. I bet that's right. And you know what else? And they tried to read deeper meanings into everything. Song lyrics, in this case, album covers. If you look up here, this Volkswagen Beetle, its license plate says LMW 28IF. Well, that was supposed to be a secret message that if Paul McCartney was still alive when Abbey Road came out in September of 69, he would be 28 if he was still alive, if he hadn't been killed. Now, if you look as they're walking across Abbey Road, you know, they're all dressed in their own different style. You know, first three, John, Ringo. Paul, George, first three are dressed in suits. John is dressed in solid white. You know, he's got the long hair. You know, he's got a bushy beard. People said he symbolized Jesus. <laughs> this is supposed to be the funeral procession. Ringo, dressed in black and white. He's the pastor presiding over the funeral. Paul McCartney, since he had died in a car wreck or supposed to have died in a car wreck. And, you know, he doesn't have his jacket buttoned up like the others did. He doesn't have shoes on. He has the last cigarette in his hand. And if you look way back here in the distance, the lane that he's in, there's a car coming down this lane. And in the back, the only one not wearing a suit, wearing an outfit completely out of denim, denim shirt, you know, denim pants. Looks like tennis shoes, but they're still probably, you know, expensive dress shoes. You got George Harrison. Okay, a couple of things about this funeral procession. One, John just had his own unique style. And he's not trying to actually, he caught a lot of flack several years earlier for at one point saying that the Beatles were bigger than Jesus. Uh, doubt that he would have tried to represent Jesus on a album cover. Uh, Paul McCartney, the fact that his jacket's unbuttoned and he doesn't have shoes on, you know, has a cigarette in his hand, he, this is supposed to represent that he's the deceased that the funeral procession's being for and that he died in a car accident and there's a car in the lane headed toward him. No, the car isn't headed towards him because if you look at all the vehicles up and down the street, they're all facing the other direction. It's a one-way street and the vehicle's traveling away from Paul. George is supposed to be the grave digger because he's dressed in the type of clothing that working class manual laborers would have worn. No, that was just George's personality. That was his style. Um, 
you know, this vehicle right here is also supposed to be an ambulance. Like, if he had died in a car wreck, the body would have been taken away in an ambulance. Uh, it, just so many things that people drew from this that they had no, you know, that there was no foundation for. And this spot, this, this, uh, the theory also spun into that, uh, Paul McCartney had died. They covered up the death, and they even had a uh, – because there had been a, a pretty substantial, a pretty big look-alike, Beatles look-alike contest, and the guy that won was supposed to be uh, – was supposed to have been a Paul look-alike, and you know, the whole secret – reality behind why they did this look-alike contest in England was to try to find a replacement for Paul. You know, people were trying to zoom in on the pictures and say, oh, well, you know, this doesn't look right. It looks like, you know, his nose used to be different, stuff like that. People just went nuts about this. Uh, another thing about this is that if you look right here, there is, you know, an older gentleman just kind of standing out on the uh, sidewalk looks like he's watching them pass by this guy had no he's probably looking this way because you've got these four guys walking through the street and you've got a photographer taking pictures of him he probably doesn't even know who these you know shaggy you know shaggy headed hippies are but you know it's an older guy he and his wife were vacationing in england when this picture was taken and he's from Wisconsin. I believe he's, I believe it's Wisconsin. Well, it turns out that their nephew or great nephew was a Beatles fan. And after Abbey Road comes out, and, you know, I guess he was looking at the album cover because of, you know, all the stories, all the rumors about what it symbolized and what it meant. He looks at it closer and he recognizes this guy. It's his, it's his uncle or his great uncle. And he ends up calling his, uh, the man's wife and says, you know, when were you all in England? And she tells him and he was like, uh, I've got something I want to show you all. And, you know, the next time that they get together, you know, he pulls out the album cover for Abbey Road and shows him. He's like, when, when you were in England by any chance, you know, were you in this area? Uh, did you happen to see, these four guys walking across the street and he's like, yeah, he's like, I had no idea why, you know, somebody was out in the middle of the road taking a picture of four guys walking across the street. So that just kind of happened kind of like in, uh, you know, it's just a, an accident that happened. That guy wasn't supposed to be there. Kind of like if you watch the Mandalorian and I'm going to date this video now. So if it stays on the internet for 30 years, you'll know what time, you know, that this was December 2nd, you know, 2020, because on uh, two episodes ago on The Mandalorian, in the background, there was a guy in a T-shirt and blue jeans. And as, the you know, it made it through production, the episode got released. And as people started watching, watching it, they noticed a guy in the background wearing blue jeans, which I guess blue jeans don't exist in the Star Wars universe. But uh, Abbey Road was the last album they recorded together, had a couple of number one hits come together, something, uh, something ended up being uh, double platinum. Maxwell's Silver Hammer, odd song. Uh, it's about a guy that goes around killing people with a silver hammer, you know, bashes them on the head. But if you just listened to the music and you don't pay attention to the lyrics, you listen to it and it's kind of a, a happy sounding song. But then when you actually listen to the lyrics, you know, it's about this guy that, you know, goes around cracking people on the skull with uh, his little silver hammer. Octopus's Garden, the only song that the Beatles ever recorded that Ringo actually wrote. And Here Comes the Sun, uh, another George Harrison song that ends up being one of their biggest, most famous uh, later songs. Let It Be uh, ends up getting released in May of 1970, even though it was completed in the spring of 69. Uh, they started recording in January of 69. I 
think they stopped recording in March of 69. And like I said, they weren't happy with the way that the album sounded. So they just shelved it. They went their separate ways for three months, came back together in late summer. And then even though I say they threw together Abbey Road, they did a pretty good job throwing together an album that sold over 12 million copies. Uh, but even by the spring of 69, the band was falling apart. Uh, at one point, George got into a, an argument with both John and Paul. He storms off. He quits the band. Uh, just like George had talked Ringo back into the band after a couple of days, you know, after everybody had a chance to cool down, Ringo tried to play the mediator. You know, he smooth things over and that's why they do eventually get back together uh, and record Abbey Road in the late summer. Uh, but all the members were going in different directions at this point. Paul seemed to be taking control of the band. John resented that. The others resented John for bringing Yoko into the studio. They resented Yoko for weighing in on band matters when she wasn't a member of the band. And George and Ringo resented being treated like secondary members by John and Paul. Uh, you know, after Abbey Road was released, they all went their own directions. Uh, even though fans didn't realize it, after Abbey Road was released in the fall of 1969, the Beatles had essentially broken up by that point. Let It Be ends up being released in May of 1970. And December of 1970, Paul ends up suing to dissolve the band because he was taking care of all the business matters. Uh, and that is officially when the band broke up. Uh, you know, you didn't have any announcements from John or George or Ringo. It was basically, you know, Paul meets with some reporters. He reads a, you know, a pre written statement, you know, saying that the band was dissolving. And then it becomes the legal matter of how they're going to split up all the song rights and stuff like that. Basically, if you wrote the songs, you're the ones that were you were going to get those songs as part of the catalog. So this splits the Beatles uh, recording catalog up. The ones that belong to John end up uh, being the songs that he wrote. Paul's songs end up going to him. George's much smaller group of songs goes to him and Ringo. He gets uh, the recording rights to Octopus's Garden. Uh, so now that they each had the rights to certain songs, that's going to create issues down the road for uh, people licensing Beatles music to use in advertisements and movies and stuff like that because Paul McCartney might say, yeah, you, you know, for this much money you can use these songs well what about revolution or what about this song well that's that's not my song that belongs to uh john lennon's estate which when he died it ends up uh belonging to yoko ono and in the early 80s you know a few years after john lennon died yoko ono decides to sell off you know the rights to his beatles song but, you know whoever owns the rights to a song if it's put on another album if it's used in a movie if it's used in a commercial uh, anything to do with licensing, they're the ones that get the money from that. Well, Paul McCartney ended up telling in 82, 83, when they were working together for a song on the Thriller album, Paul, Paul McCartney and Michael Jackson had become really good friends. And, you know, Michael Jackson had grown up a Beatles fan. Paul McCartney tells, you know, Michael Jackson in confidence, you know, privately, he said, uh, they haven't made a public announcement yet, but Yoko Ono is going to put up John's part of the Beatles catalog. So, you know, I'm I'm probably going to buy those up and try to reunite the rights to most of the Beatles music. Well, they finish recording their song. You know, they work together for a couple of weeks. They finish recording their song, and then they go their separate ways. The auction takes place. John Lennon was, or not John Lennon, Paul McCartney was there in person. And he gets into a bidding war with somebody on the phone. The person on the phone ends up winning the bid for John Lennon's uh, back catalog. And it turns out that that person was Michael Jackson. And that pretty much ended the friendship between Michael Jackson and Paul McCartney because Paul McCartney told him that 
you know, like I said, in confidence, you know, privately, just telling him, you know, I'm trying to reunite the Beatles songs. And Michael Jackson went out and, you know, he had a crazy amount of money at that point. Young guy didn't know what to do with it. So, you know, he loved Beatles music, so he went out and bought it out from under Paul McCartney. Uh, so that ended their friendship right there. But, you know, that's a story for another day, I guess. Um, notable songs off this album were Let It Be, It Goes Double Platinum, one of the most famous Beatles songs of all time. Long and Winding Road also ended up making it to number one on pop charts. It Goes Gold. And that ends up bringing this chapter to an end. Uh, if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, you know, I know it's a lot harder while we're on remote, but if you have anything that you need to ask about, you're not sure about, uh, make sure that you email me, contact me somehow, and we'll get it figured out. I uh, hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, again, we will end up having a Chapter 3 test in the last day or two before Christmas break, so December 16th, December, December 17th. Make sure that you keep an eye on the Google Classroom for announcements about uh, when I'm going to post that test. You need to make sure that you get it taken before December 18th because that is the end of the semester. And, you know, once the semester's over, you know, I, I'm, if you try to turn something in December 30th, I will not be accepting it. You need to get it turned in before uh, the deadline at the end of the semester. Uh, make sure that you're turning in your uh, This Week in Rock and your music assessment assignments. Uh, whenever an assignment post that is a quiz over chunks of these slides out of this lecture uh, set of lecture notes, make sure that you hit submit because if you turn it in but you don't hit submit on the Google form, it won't let me see it to grade it. And if I can't grade it, I can't give you a, a score on it. Uh, if you again, if you have any questions, just get in contact with me and hopefully we'll see you all after a good Christmas break.